Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Since we can't go into the grill room, we thought we'd bring the grill room to you. First of all, we want to be sure that you're uh, home and safe and healthy uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. And we think today's guest is especially timely. timely. He was born in 1924 during the Roaring Twenties. Hemlines and speakeasies in the stock market were soaring, and he remembers beautiful family vacations on Lake Champlain, spending time in boats and enjoying his early childhood. He was too young to understand the stock market crash in 29, but he suffered through the aftermath and came of age as America slid into the bread lines and descent of the Great Depression. When he was nine years old, President Roosevelt closed all the banks and his dad was fresh out of a job. And then on December 7th, 1941, while he was a senior in high school, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and thrust America into World War II. A month later, Roy graduated from high school and a few months after that, he joined the Marines. Our guest today is a 96-year-old Marine Corps veteran of World War II. He served in active combat across the Pacific Theater, including taking the fabled beach at Iwo Jima. I am pleased and genuinely honored to introduce our speaker today, a member of the greatest generation, Roy Earl. Roy, welcome to our show. And tell us, why did you want to be a Marine? I was mad at the Japs because they attacked us. And so I wanted to get into it. And I figured the fastest way to get into that is the Marine Corps. They fought in the Pacific. And uh, so, yeah, I wanted to be a Marine. Talk to us a little bit about why the United States Navy and the military in general were so interested in... in, in uh, and Iwo Jima, this little teeny island. Well, back in uh, 1944, we had taken the islands of Saipan and Tinian, and I was on both. Um, and then we got airfields there, and we then introduced brand new planes called the B-29. It could reach Japan from those islands and get back. So we started a bombing campaign. The trouble was that during the run, we passed over or very near to an island called Iwo Jima. That had an airfield on it. And they would many times intercept our planes or at least warn Japan that they were coming. And uh, we had to stop this. So they wanted to get that island out of the way as far as the Air Force was concerned. So uh, the, uh, what we called the Fifth Corps of the Marine Corps, uh, the Third, Fourth, and Fifth Marines, uh, Fifth Marine Divisions were assigned to um, take care of the island. Now they thought it was gonna be an easy job they had bombed it for 74 straight days from Saipan and Tinian. And in the last three days before we landed, the big ships came in and shelled it for three days. And we figured, boy, that would take care of them. And believe it or not, it never touched them. They had 15 miles of tunnels and they would just go down there, and when the bombing was finished, they'd come up, uh, fix up the airfield again, and they were ready to go. So they decided we had to stop this. And there we go. We, we um, landed. The 4th uh, and 5th Divisions were in assault. There's your landing beaches. And uh, I was on Yellow Beach 1. Yellow Beach 1 and 2 were 23rd Marines, it was regiments. And uh, the next ones over to the right are Blue Beach 1 and 2, and that was the 25th Marines. 
they were the assault regiment over there. Next to us on the left was the, well, first of all, the 27th went in, that's 5th Division, and then right behind him was the 26th. The 28th was down to the left even more, and the 28th was assigned to take the mountain, which oh. they did, Mount Suribachi. <laughs> and um, um, when they took it, uh, they were able to uh, raise a flag, and uh, believe it or not, that flag was up for a couple of days before I even knew it was there. Now, well, back to the beginning. You hit the beach at 9.15. Yeah, uh, it was five minutes between waves. I was in the fourth wave. The first wave landed at nine o'clock, and this is what we looked like when we landed on the beach. And uh, they were hollering, get off the beach, get off the beach, because five minutes behind you was another one coming in, and so on. And uh, I landed, as I say, in the fourth wave. I was communications. I was in charge of the switchboard and I had to get in. Now the switchboard is 75 pounds. I had to carry it, but I kept hitting my knee on it. And so I decided to put it on my head to make it easier. I thought maybe I could run. When we hit the, the beach, it turned out to be ash and sand and you didn't run in that stuff. It was almost ankle deep. And so, there were five terraces from when we landed up to the airfield. And um, we, I got up as far as the second terrace and found the big shell hole. And I jumped down into it and put this switchboard in. And uh, that was... Um, How far apart were the terraces? How far do you run up the beach, up the hill to get to the next terrace? Uh, well, it wasn't too far, uh, just far enough to be in a pain in the neck. But like, like, like 20 yards, a football run at 20 yards? Yeah, I would say about that. And uh -huh. um, then you up you go, and, and um, then you try to get down. And boy, when you hit, you first landed, you went down to get your bearings. Then when you went, you went up the next terrace. That's when I found the big shell hole, uh -huh. and I jumped down into it with the switchboard. This is said, what the beach looked like after a few days. Um, we really took a shellac in there. Uh, they had everything sighted in, and they let us have it. Now, um, the uh, carriers came in after we landed, and some of their planes and you see these are the go away, go wing planes, the F4U Corsairs, and, and that's what the Marines have. And the Marines are a self-contained unit, including their own Air Force. And they had about 35 planes per division, and we each had our own small flat top. And these are some of the fourth division planes. And boy, these guys weren't good. And when you call for strafing, you had to keep your head down or you'd get tire marks on your helmet. <laughs> so, um, they let you know. So, okay, um, there we are. That's what happens when you just land. You get down to get your bearings, to find out where you were, then, then you go up. And then our tanks began to come in. And they bogged down in that. So we had to get the pioneers and engineers in to lay some mats down so that the wheeled vehicles could get in. This is a flame-throwing tank. And let me tell you, that uh, flame shot out, I would say, maybe 15, 20 yards. But uh, you don't want to be too close to that because it sucked all the oxygen out of the air very quickly. And it surprised you. You were gasping for breath. But then they only did it in shots. And they didn't keep it for any length of time. Amazing. Uh, amazing. Paul's story is amazing. <clears throat> right. 
you know, you're on uh, the right side of the frame here. You yeah. are part of the picture. <laughs> okay, now, um, they kept shooting at it. They had the whole island set, uh, sighted in so that they just fired and would, I guess we landed about 60,000 troops the first day with that many on this little island, all they had to do was shoot and they're gonna hit somebody. And they usually did, but I was very fortunate. I did not get hit. This was my fourth battle with the fourth division. Amazing. I had been on the Marshals, uh, Roy Moore and the Kwajalein Atoll. I had been on Saipan, I had been on Tinian, each one in the assault waves. And I came through all four of them without getting hit. Now, when when the men were hit, they we had stretcher bearers that would go out and pick them up and bring them back. If they were real bad, they had little uh, surgical units set up uh, with doctors. But then they patched them up so they could get them back to the hospital ships. And this picture shows the corpsmen, as we call them, the corpsmen taking care of them and getting them ready to ship back to the uh, ships or to take back to the ships. Um, and for some reason or other, um, every time some uh, one of the men were, was wounded, somebody else would light a cigarette and shove it in their mouth, I guess to calm them down or whatever. And this is what he's doing. He's offering a cigarette to a wounded man. How did you guys get the cigarettes? <laughs> These cigarettes were terrible. Um, they were off-brand cigarettes. I can't remember all of them. 20 grand and well, they were two, but there were others you never heard of. Those are the cigarettes we got. The fellas who smoked uh, never got any of the Camel, Chesterfield, Old Gold, or whatever they were. They we always wondered which war they went to because they didn't go to our war. <laughs> so they so went even to if you didn't smoke, But how did you get the cigarettes? How did these guys get cigarettes? How were they supplied to you? Well, uh, in our rations, the K rations, for instance, there's a little package of four cigarettes of the off brands. And that's where they got some. And uh, later on when they, uh, sent some supplies and they sent supplies of cigarettes, I guess. I don't know, I didn't smoke, so I wasn't sure how they got them in. Is is that wire that's going right down the beach, is this one of the wires that you would have like laid right there? Is that no. how, no, that's not, that's just a scratch maybe on the film? Yeah, no, no, that, that wasn't anything. Okay. No, we just laid them right along the ground. Uh, there's obviously no trees and no uh, poles you couldn't put them up and, and you wouldn't go up anyhow. And then, no, we just laid them along the ground and hooked them up. And now, when you say you laid the wires, this is because you were a switchboard guy, and in order yeah. to get, um, not use radio communication, but wired communication, you yeah. guys would communicate from platoon to platoon with, with phones? Is that how you did yeah. it? Well, uh, I was, I belonged to a unit called JASCO. Now it's a joint assault signal company and that each company was attached to a battalion. Now I was in the 3rd Battalion, 23rd Marines, the 23rd Marine Regiment. And um, we had wiremen, that's telephone men, who did switchboards and the field linemen laying lines. Then we had air, um, air wing, and uh, they were attached to the planes by radio. And uh, they could talk to the pilots and they had a target square, so did the pilots. And whenever we wanted uh, to call fire on a certain area, they just tell them where on the uh, map they wanted them to hit and boy, they did. And then the third group, was naval gunfire. And each battalion had a ship. I remember in uh, Marshalls, we fired from Destroyer Fox. 
and Saipan we fired from the cruiser Baltimore. And I don't remember the ship that our group was firing from uh, on Iwo. But they could call fire from the ships and they each had a target square of the, of the uh, island. And they would just tell the gunnery, sorry, a gunnery um, officer out there on whatever ship they were assigned. And they would, the ship would just fire into where they told them to. So you're, you would radio communications. How far distance between the platoons when you're on the beach? Was this like 30 yards? How long would you stretch these wires, these telephone wires? To oh, well, uh, it depends on how far they got in. Uh -huh. Our objective was the first airfield. Now, there were five different levels um, up to the airfield. And believe it or not, we did not make the airfield the first day. Wow. Uh, the fire was so intense. Um, and we had so many casualties that first day that uh, they had to stop short. But we ran wire out to wherever they were. And uh, that first day, just to keep them in touch because they had to be in touch with the uh, shore party commander and the um, fellow that was in charge of the dump. I can't think of his name right offhand. But our... So tell us about this picture right here. This is the mountain up here. This is your Bachi right here. Yeah, this is later on. Uh, we had to be had to get supplies in as well as men. And uh, I mean, you're shooting up the place. You better get supplies of ammo. And um, so we uh, a beach master. That's the, and uh, he was in charge of all the dumps if for our group. Uh, All the what? All the what? What was he in charge of? At the dumps, the uh, ammo, medical supplies, okay. food, whatever. Okay. And so um, when the guys were running out of ammo, they'd call back and say, and they'd get a hold of the, the beach master and say, "Look, we need such and such ammo. We'll send some guys back for it." And uh, that's how they got it. Now, the other line we had to make sure was the shore party commander. He was Navy, he was down the beach a little, and uh, he knew what was on every cargo ship out there. And so if we were running low on, say, mortar ammunition, um, if the word got back, the beach master would call the shore party commander and say, hey, we're running short of 16 millimeter uh, ammo. Uh, for our mortars, and the uh, shore party commander knew what cargo ship that was on, and so he would radio out to radio out to the ship, tell them what they needed, and tell them what beach to send it into, and uh, that's how we kept communications going. Now you said earlier that this whole island is only eight square miles, and it had that's fifteen correct. miles of tunnels underground. We're looking at Mount Sarabachi. How deep were the tunnels generally? They were so deep that they had living quarters down there. They had hospital down there. They had um, uh, feeding facilities down there, but they also had sites just looking out, punched through, that they could get a rifle through and they would just shoot as somebody went by. Also, they had blockhouses, pillboxes, and so on down there. They had ammunition. They had all their supplies down there. So it was very, very deep. And um, so they, they were putting a lot of stuff down there. What do you think this is? What is this wire hanging here like this? We're looking at the carnage on the battlefield 36 days after yep. the start of the launch. <clears throat> what would that be right there? Why is that hanging like that? The post. I have no idea. Okay. And this None is, whatsoever. this is, what, what did it feel like walking around? You know, I like, didn't walk around very much. Uh huh. Uh, and when you walked, you never were straight up. You were always bent over. Uh -huh. And whenever you stopped, uh, you never stopped to talk by standing up. Um, 
you just either kneel down or sat down or something to get off the line. And this is a fellow resting with a dog. This is one of our dog. Uh, uh, what with the dog? Talk about the role of the dogs. Oh, the dog could sniff out where the traps were. Uh, and they had to keep low, and we lost a lot of the dogs, too. But they were very good. And also, like at night, uh, they could tell if when some of the Japs were sneaking up or what. They could warn you. So they didn't, so you're saying that the enemy didn't come out of the pox of the tunnels except at night, did you say? That's correct. They so learned. They, uh -huh. they used to attack us. When we first got on, and of course, we were ready for them, and we just riddled them. But uh, on Iwo, the uh, Jap general was very smart, and he kept everybody back. But he had all these slits and pillboxes and blockhouses and everything all sighted in on the beach. And um, they were ready for us, let me tell you. And boy, did they give us a shellacking. But we got them. But one thing about this, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, is that this is the only battle that the Marines ever fought that we had more casualties than the enemy. Wow. Because we had almost 7,000 killed and about 18,000 or so uh, wounded. Uh, which about 25,000 or so. Um, the Japs only had between 20 and 22,000 on the island, and we killed most of them. But uh, uh, they, we had more casualties than they did when you counted our wounded. Now, I'm looking at this guy with his samurai sword over his head. And that was not me. on Iwo. Uh-huh. So that this picture... Okay. He is chopping somebody's head off. That's that. I've seen other pictures like that. Okay. And I've seen a, like a film with that, uh, with somebody just like that. Okay. And that's what he's doing. He's got a guy kneeling in front of him, a, a captive, and he just chopped his head off. So you got talk to me about the whole idea about you didn't want to be prisoners. You mentioned that to me. No, no, you never wanted to surrender if you could help it. And uh, no, because they uh, they treated their prisoners very badly, um, killing most of them. Wow! And, uh, <clears throat> now this is uh, B twenty four taking off, and uh, these are the ones that used to fly up from Saipan to bomb the island for those seventy. Some days. Some so days. There these these B twenty fours and this on the ground is a B twenty nine, isn't it? B twenty nine, yeah, that's our ground. big plane, big plane. And these and these used to be harassed when they would be flying to Japan because yeah. of the Japanese holding Iwo Jima until you took it. Yeah, got the it. idea of taking Iwo Jima is to get rid of those uh, Jap uh, zeros, and uh, so. We managed the B 29s went through to bomb uh, Japan, and the B 24s would bomb uh, Iwo so that we could finally get our own, um, I don't know, our new, we had new um, uh, fighters uh -huh. that we brought into to, uh, uh, here. Iwo, and they they could now uh, escort the bombers into Japan. Now, talk to us about this picture. This is Sarabachi, not Sarabachi, way in the far ground, and this is the <laughs> beach that you guys landed on, yes? Oh, I tell you, this, this is many years afterwards because yeah. it didn't look like that when I got there. <laughs> This is uh, after they got it all straightened out and the airfields working and so on. And you can see buildings and stuff there, I think. And uh, there were no buildings that we ever saw. <laughs> now, Iwo Jima, it turns out, became one of the most celebrated battles in U.S. military history. 
Yeah. And when did you start discovering that you'd been part of one of, you know, the most famous battles in history? When did it start occurring to you that you... Oh, not until long after the war was over, because uh, to, to us, it was just one more battle. And sure, it was tough, but each battle that we fought in was tougher because we were getting closer to the Japanese islands and uh, they were defending them better. And so we never realized uh, all of this big, uh, what to do about it. Um, well, no, it didn't come till much later that they made more of the Iwo thing. And I think one of the reasons was that flag raising picture that you see there in the corner um, that Joe Rosenthal took. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that was, you know, became so popular. They even made a stamp from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this must have been many years later. Some that wasn't overseas. This was someplace. So you guys would get together. Food. Talk about talk about the gatherings. Talk about the reunions of. Honor. Oh yeah, yeah. Now I was with the fourth division, and after the war, um, we. Uh, we had reunions. I'm trying to think what year they started. I think in 48, they started getting together. And the um, General Cates is one of the ones who initiated this. And after that, every year, someplace in the country, we gathered together and there was groups that would take over to run the, the reunion. You mean you'd gather someplace in America for a reunion? Yeah. And okay. yeah, and um, so uh, I know I was in charge of reunion uh, Fredericksburg. in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which is right near Quantico uh -huh. uh, one time. Mm -hmm. And I was president of the whole association when we had our reunion in Atlanta. And that was a great, great reunion. How many guys then, did you show up? And then I had another reunion in Portland, Maine, and they told us to expect 1,200. So I completely uh, reserved five hotels. By the time we had the reunion, <laughs> we ran out of rooms. Believe it or not, we had never been to Maine before as in a reunion. And 1,741 people showed up. Boy, did we scramble for rooms. And how would you like to plan a thousand uh, lobster feeds on the island, on the beach? Yeah. We no, nobody was ever supposed to uh, reserve any uh, beach at any time. But we did. <laughs> We tell me about over. this. Tell me about when you have these get togethers with your yep. buddies. Each you're getting older each year, you have a reunion. Who's this? Oh, buddy? yeah. Who's this guy? And this was uh, one of the reunions. And I think this was when we had a reunion down in Camp Pendleton. But um, yeah, these were some of my buddies. The one in front with me. So this is you right buddy. here? This is you in the black shirt? Yes. Yep. You in the black and shirt. and the, the other fellow in the white shirt there, yeah, that was my foxhole buddy. And wow. it means in foxhole, you always had two men at night because one would stay up and the other would sleep. And then when you began to get tired, you wake the other guy up so that somebody was always awake and uh, all night. Now you said when you begin to get tired, explain explain that to us. You didn't. You didn't well, have particular uh, hours. You're, you're awake. They are just. You're listening, making sure they're not. The Japs start coming out and jumping in the foxholes or something, and uh, so you're just uh, staying alert, so to speak. Uh -huh. And now you begin to get sleepy, so you don't take a chance on falling asleep. You immediately wake up your buddy no matter how much how much time it was there's no such thing as 
uh, two hours on and four off or something like that, you stayed awake until you began getting sleepy. Then you made sure that your buddy was awake, not he didn't say, oh, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to wait. No, 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 no. You made sure, you made him sit up and, and um, make sure he was awake. Then you tried to crawl inside your, your helmet, you know, to sleep. So, so describe the environment. How, you're in a foxhole. It's like five feet deep. How deep is the hole? Yes, you about had to get below the level of the ground. That's how deep you were. Okay. Uh, you didn't spend time digging a lot of good because you didn't plan on staying in that spot that long. How long but would you? How long would you be there? An hour, two minutes? How long? Well, I don't know. It depends on how fast we were moving. Uh -huh. You know, we're behind the front lines, right behind them, so we can't move until they do. And when they get moving up, then we moved up to be close to them. How would you get the word, okay, time to move up again? Would it be verbally you hear it or would it be on the radio or how? Yeah, they would tell us on the phone we're moving. Okay. And uh, we'd pick up the switchboard and move it. But then our unit was only uh, for the invasion part. Uh, once we got them all set and got them established and so on, they had their own phone equipment and their own switchboards. And they began to hook into that. Then they didn't need us anymore. So we became what they called expendable. Um, and uh, what they did was that um, they uh, decided, or it was radioed back or phoned back or something that they needed communication men. We had some of our wiremen were wounded. We need two wiremen or three wiremen or radio men or whatever. And so we waited until we got the call. I got the call. Um, they called back to our command post and the command post found out who was out there. And I got the call and I had to move up and I fought the rest of the battle, uh, say, after about five days, six days, I was with the 81 millimeter mortars of the 3rd Battalion, 23rd. And um, that's where I spent the rest of the battle with the mortar outfit. So this photograph, tell us about when you learned about um, him taking the picture. You said it wasn't, wasn't the same day, it was a couple days later. Well, how did that happen? This this was about the 23rd. We landed on 19th. This was four days later. After the and invasion. By this, uh -huh. by this time, we that was the 5th Division. We were the 4th Division. 4th Division was already moving up. Now, we landed down near the mountain, so we had to turn right to go up the island. Uh, well, we went up a ways where they could get the mortar set because they can hit something pretty far away. And um, I never saw that go up. I didn't know the flag was up for two or three days. And then finally, one of my friends said, hey, did you see the flag? And I said, no, where? And he pointed up on the top of the mountain. And then that's the first I saw it. So, uh, and, and so you got the story about it. A buddy told you about it. So talk about your environment. What are you wearing? And uh, how, at nighttime when you're sleeping, talk about the weather. <laughs> what you're wearing is what you landed in. You didn't bring a change of clothes or anything like that. You wore what when you went in and for the whole time you're on the island. And um, you might bring extra socks. Sometimes you change your socks. But in, on Iwo, we weren't in, in any water or anything, so we didn't have worry about that too much. And so what, how much, what about food? Did you have food with you while you're on Iwu? I mean, obviously you had food, but I mean, is, did you well, have a backpack? How'd you take a, yeah, we take a couple of um, um, packets of K-rations with us, and then they would get some to us later on. But um, they had, uh, K-rations came in a package 
and it was labeled breakfast or lunch or dinner. And you always like to get the dinner because that they had a big round uh, can of cheese, and that was good. <laughs> uh, the other, the, the biscuits in there, we used to call them dog biscuits because you could hardly bite them. They were so hard. And that's where the little pack of cigarettes was, too. Uh -huh. Now, you said cigarettes a couple of times. Are you saying that the cigarette companies deliberately put cigarettes in all the K rations? Oh, I don't know anything about that. Uh, all I know is there was a packet of these uh, uh, cigarettes uh, that were <laughs> ones we never heard of, at least the smokers. But uh, they so talk about your armament. What did you have for armaments when you're on the beach and when you're moving around? Did you have a rifle? Did you have a pistol? What did you have? No, I, I had a, a carbine, which is a small uh, 30 caliber, 15 round clip in there. And uh, if we were uh, attack or anything, we had, but I usually had that slung over my back because I was busy doing other things. I had infantry in front of me that were taking care of the Japs, supposedly. How many extra clips did you have on you in your in your ammo belt? In the dump? You oh, know, on, the your, dump? on your how many how many extra clips of how many did I carry? Yeah. Oh not too many, about a couple, because it were fifteen on a clip. And I wasn't there to to uh, shoot. I was there to <laughs> fix telephones and and put in communication. So, uh, but I had to protect myself. So that's why I had a rifle. So tell but us I, about. Uh, you told me once in in our earlier interview about being real close to um, being under the barrel of one of the tanks at one point. Oh, and or, and also next to the the cannon. So it's dark. Moving around, you have flashlights. How do you know what's going on? Oh, flashlight! Never, 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 never. It was dark, pitch black, and uh, no, that was a time when um, I had secured from the, the uh, switchboard. I'd been on all day. We worked twelve-hour shifts, and um, I crawled up out of the uh, shell hole. And there were fellows there and so on. They were talking about the day. And all of a sudden, the fellow on the switch would holler up and said, K Company's out. That meant that the, the line to K Company, which was an infantry company, uh, had been cut or, or broken, I guess. And um, so what, what uh, happened was we had to send out somebody to fix it. So the, the lieutenant said, okay, who hasn't been out today? <laughs> Funny, all the lines um, began, or all the eyes began to look at me because I had been down the hole all day. So I said, okay, okay, let's go. But what happened is we learned way back in the early battles that, um, um, they would cut a line, the Japs would cut a line and wait for somebody to come and fix it and shoot them. So what we did now is we sent two people out, one to fix a wire and one to protect the guy who was fixing the wire. So we called him riding shotgun. <laughs> and uh, they looked around again and the only one who hadn't been out was the lieutenant. So he was riding shotgun for me. His job was to take extra wire. I took all the gear I would need to fix wire and we were ready to go. Now his only job going out with me is to protect me. And uh, he didn't worry about the line or anything like that. He was protecting me. I worried about the line. And I would start out, I went right down to the switchboard so that I knew which terminal was out and put the wire there in my hand and just slid it through there. And that's how I kept 
kept the line in tow. And I just went right along the line like that until I ran out of wire. And that's where the break was. So I said to the lieutenant, I said, okay, you wait right here. Here's the break. And I'll go find the rest of it. So I started crawling around. And um, after quite a ways, I found the other end. I had a test phone with me, so I just got on. And you never ring a phone in battle. So... Uh, Why you don't ring a phone in battle? Because... Uh, the enemy will see you, learn where you are, etc. No, they wouldn't see you. They'd hear you. Uh -huh. and, you, know, you ring. So they, all they, they kept the line open all the time at night. All, all lines were open. Everybody could talk to everybody. So, but nobody talked to anybody. In, in our, we just kept it quiet. But I got on, I clipped on that wire and said, okay, uh, this K company. I said, I'm on it. So that meant that I was fixing it. And um, so I found there, I had taken the wire that the lieutenant had brought with me. Now I, I spliced it together with the wire I had. Now I took the wire back and ran out of line. So he had to go back and get some more. Your lieutenant had to go back. Lieutenant did, yeah. So. I just sat there on my haunches and prepared it for splicing. And uh, I uh, did that. And while I'm doing that, all of a sudden there was a bright flash and a huge bang that practically lifted me off the ground. And I thought, oh God, I've got it now. Boy, I dove down into the sand and uh, would have challenged the mole to get down in there. <laughs> and then it was just dead silence, very quiet. And so I I finally lifted my head a little bit and looked around. I didn't see anything. So I got back up and I began to check my legs and toes and hands and I was fine. Got up on my haunches and got back to, to splice and I could swear I heard somebody laughing and I'm thinking, Boy, I really got it this time. Imagine, uh, here's somebody laughing out here. And what happened was I had crawled around and I had settled, settled pretty much where I was working on the wire, right behind the muzzle of a 105 artillery piece. And I looked up, and here was a, a revetment. They had built up a wall of uh, sandbags. And the, the artillery piece was behind the sandbags, but the barrel of the thing was sticking out before they go. And I had managed to work right under it and didn't know it. And when it went off, it was right over my head. And that's what I heard. Your head. How far yeah. was the barrel from your head? Oh, I don't know, maybe uh, 10 feet. Good. And, uh, but, you know, uh, I heard it go off and practically lifted me off the ground, but it was outgoing, not incoming. <laughs> and that's what they were laughing about. They would, they could see me. And so when I was, re I was ready before the, the lieutenant got back, so I walked over or bent and walked over to the wall there and I'm talking to them and I wasn't very happy. They were laughing at me <laughs> because they, when they fired, they, you know, they watched me dive into the ground, you know, <laughs> and everything and, and then get back up and all I went through to get back to business and so on. So what yeah. essentially, give us, show us with your hand the diameter of the shell that was shot out of that, um, out of that um, oh, gun. It was a big one, Ed. The big one was 155. This is a 105 and then- they Use your hand, show me, show me the size. This is like size, the size of an arm. How, how big is the shell? Uh, round this way and I don't, I have no about this. Big. Holy and, cow. Um, 
it, I'll tell you, it was something else, and they were great. And uh, of course, I un I figure out now, I have a, I had to wear hearing aids because of that uh, shell going off. I was so close to it and everything. Now, you, the, uh, how far were they shooting away from you guys when when this was happening? Well, I don't know. I, like I a half a mile, a quarter of a mile, 100 yards? Oh, no, they were going way up the other end of the island. They wouldn't use a 105 just for 100 yards or something. They were way up. They were shooting the other end of the island. Uh huh. And um, I, what I said was, you know, why didn't you let me know you were there? And I, they said, now, how could we do that? But... I, the guy said to me, you didn't hear them open the breach? I said, no. You didn't hear them put the shell in? I said, no. He said, you didn't hear them slam the breach? I said, no. And he said, you didn't hear them yell fire? I said, no, but I heard it go off. <laughs> and they I, know why they were, I know why they were laughing. I'm laughing now, Roy, seven yeah, years later. Well, yeah, right. And, you know. I didn't think it was very funny at the time. But <laughs> afterwards, I understand why it was funny. <laughs> this is a good story three quarters of a century later, right? 75 yeah. years later. So um, when, you're, when you're crawling around at night, how do you stay warm? You don't have blankets. You don't have sleeping bags. What do you, what? What do, you do? You shiver. <laughs> But you told me that, the, that when you dug down into the into the uh, volcanic sand, that it got warmer as you got lower. Well, you're sitting on top of a volcano, and um, it's very hot. You get down just a little bit away from the sand, and it becomes solid clay. And when you get down into that or on top of that, that's very hot. And so. At night, when you scrape down as far as you can to get below the surface, uh, that's hot. So you're laying in there, and at night, it gets pretty cool there. So you're cold on top and sweltering underneath, and you kept turning and turning. We used to try during the day, we try to get cardboard out of maybe uh, some of the boxes that were showing around. And... Um, put the box, uh, fold the box and everything and lay it down at the bottom of your foxhole so you could lay on it. And then you just curl up as best you can on top. And uh, that was it. And you just kept turning over and turning over and so on. So when you're, when you're laying there in, in the gravel or actually it's my stand you said, um, yeah. essentially, we're gonna take a look at that for a second here. Um, uh, you would dig down inside inside the this volcanic sand. Oh yeah, yeah. You try to get to below the surface. Would you use a little shovel? Below the surface. Let's, let's talk about let's talk about the gear. Here's it. Here's a guy. Did he look? You look like this, except you were also carrying the switch board with you too. What's he got? This is a backpack. What are these? I have no idea. Are? Okay. Mm. Everybody's got a little. I see a spade shovel right here on this guy's back. Did you have a spade yeah. shovel with you? Yeah, we, I, I, as part of our pack, it had either a pick or a shovel. And uh, the shovel was digging your foxhole. And uh -huh. when, when you got finished settling down, you could pull that shovel off of your pack and dig in. Uh-huh. <clears throat> so now, as, as time went on after the war, years later, let's call it decades later, after the war, and you began to hear more and more people talk about Iwo Jima. Yeah. Um, the rest of us out here in the world, we began to, to learn more and more and more about it. And it became really kind of an iconic, um, you know, um, event in the history of military. When did you discover that the Battle of Iwo Jima would be what the Marines Memorial in Washington, D.C. would be based on? When did you first discover that? Oh, I have no idea. Um, you know, as, as we began to have our meetings and so on, our reunions, uh, we, of course, we were in four different battles. 
And uh, Saipan was particularly tough. Tinian uh, uh, wasn't that it's tough, but it was bad enough. And, and the Marshalls, of course, was the easiest of the bunch. But uh, each battle got tougher and tougher. So uh, it, how was how was Iwo Jima uh, different? Describe the ways it was different from the first three battles that you were in. Were they always a beach assault? Or what was different about the terrain and so on? The difference was they didn't try to beat us off right away. In other words, they didn't attack us the first night. They just sat back and said, come to us, baby. We got rifles here, machine guns and so on. And so they didn't sat. In, in the other battles, we were able to eliminate a whole bunch of them that first night because they just ran right into our um, firepower. This time they did not. They stayed back in their whole, their block houses and pillboxes and tunnels. And uh, they could just poke out of these slots every once in a while and wait for somebody to come past them. And they'd shoot them. And that, that was different. So the, it this sounds like you're... Yeah, so this is the underground tunnels were unique to Iwo Jima. Is this what they used here? Did you see those as well in the other battle sites? No, 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 no. This is the first time that we ran into something like this. And of course, in the preparation of landing, the planners did not know that there was tunnels there. And they did not know that the Japs were below ground. They bombed them for 74 straight days and never touched them. They shelled them with three days from the battleships and cruisers and so on. Never touched them. And of course, they were waiting for us when we came in. And I'll tell you, we took a shellac. We really did. And I so, was very, very lucky. So would you usually move during the daytime and hunker down at night, what, yeah. was the, what was the model? What, was, what were you doing? What was the method? Well, and during the day, you made sure all the lines were operating and so on. And uh, at night, you, nobody wandered around. And okay. if you had to get out of your foxhole, the last thing you do is you know what the password is. And you have to know the password and the countersign. In other uh, words, when, when you challenge somebody, you ask them, what is the password? If they give you the proper password, you have to give them a countersign. And uh, it changes every day. So you have to be sure you're up on it. So the password would be just in your platoon or for the whole force? How big, how broadly oh, the whole the force. Everybody had our bunch, we all had the same password every uh -huh. day. How many guys in and your bunch, as you call it? Pardon? How many people were in your group with shared this password? Was this 10 people, 50 people, 100, 300? What, how big a group? Every Marine that landed knew what the password was. We for all had the same password. Okay, for that day. And then the next day, and we the changed. Reason, the reason you wanted to know this is watch out for the Marines when they're protecting something. Because the Marine would say, oh, bang, who's there? <laughs> <laughs> Give me an example of a password. Do you remember any of them? Do you remember any well, of the first, I remember the first day were automobiles. And um, the, uh, I think the first password that I remember was Ford. But later on, we had things. We like to use L's like Lincoln or something like that because the Japs had a lot of trouble pronouncing L's. And so um, you'd, you'd use Lincoln and maybe Ford would be the countersign or something like that. So uh, when I, if I get this right in the morning, in a day, you'd hear, okay, today's password is going to be Lincoln, 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 and it spread across the yeah. field. And uh, and then tell me a, an application. So you leave the foxhole at night, you go out to get mm -hmm. a wire fix, and you come back, and somebody would say, who goes there? How would it, give me the way the exchange would 
uh, transformed. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, when you're out there and so on, if you know there's somebody out in front, you holler, Marine, 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 and uh, they might say password. And uh -huh. you give them the password, and they then have to give you countersigns. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, um, and that's and as I say, that changes every day. So you got to stay alert, of knowing what the password is if you're going to get out of a foxhole. And that's day or night. So, so then essentially, <clears throat> as we've watched. Iwo Jima become this iconic symbol, really, of yeah. American military force. You know, there's any number of paintings and um, other commemorations of the battle that you were, you personally were in. It yeah. turns out um, from research we learned that, in fact, more medals of honor, the highest military medal you can win, were yeah. awarded during the battle in Iwo Jima than any yeah. battle in the over 200 year history of the of the US military. Yes, that's right, that's right. But this was a tough, tough battle. You know, they weren't out where you could get to them. They were buried in, in tunnels. And the only way we could get to them is try to block up the entrances to the tunnels if we could find them or we get our flamethrowers up to a slit where they're firing from and let them shove his nozzle in there and fire and they'd fry them in the, in the pillbox or whatever. So, so you'd have these little squads that would, that would hunt for the pillbox, identify it. Talk about that yeah. process. Well, um, our, pill, our uh, flamethrowers would, would be just for uh, emptying the pillboxes and blockhouses and get and when we found one we put rifle riflemen on the left and on the right and they would fire into the slit to keep them to keep the gaps away from it and the flame the guy with the flamethrower would sneak up and get up close enough and shove the nozzle of his flamethrower in and turn it on and that would send the fire inside the pot Foxhole. Good grief! He had to get he had to get so close the the barrel of his flamethrower would stick inside the pillbox. Is what you're saying? Oh, not inside. No, just up against the slot, the slit. Okay. Uh huh. And just so he could get that flame into the pillbox. Or so I mean, he had to get. So how close is that to the slit opening itself? <clears throat> he gets within five feet, eight feet, ten feet. He <clears throat> has to get right up against it. Good heavens! Unbelievable bravery. Right, right. That's, that's, right. that's why we had the rifleman shooting at it to keep the daps away from it because he had to get up to put his nozzle right up against that slit. So Roy, I want to say it's been a, actually an honor. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to interview you and to have you be the inaugural online Wednesday Yachting Luncheon from the St. Francis Yacht Club. And uh, we wish... <clears throat> to thank you and your good wife, Linda Earl, for the time you spent with us and for sharing these 75-year-old wartime stories that we can't really get from anybody in the modern generation. And um, we, of course, our entire generations in uh, the country is indebted to you. And uh, in, our, in our own way, we wanna honor you and say thank you very much for your gallant service and uh, your dedication your humility in the, in fact, though you're incredibly brave in what you did. And so um, I want to say thank you very much on behalf of the St. Francis Yacht Club and the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And uh, with that, our luncheon meeting um, is adjourned. Thank you very much, Roy. Thank you.